um, yeah, is to isolate bacteria. Isolate means you, you need to grow the bacteria. But you know that uh, first, there are lots of bacteria. Okay, there are bacteria everywhere, and there are many, many types of bacteria. Okay, probably in last count, there are more than uh, 5,000 to 6,000 recognized species in, in bacteria. So, but we also know that uh, bacteria has a very varied uh, physiological adaptation, which means uh, physiological needs. So, different bacteria have different needs. But when you culture a bacteria, if you remember from your from your first year, do you do culture work in your first year? Did, I mean, for your practical biology, barely. And barely, we we don't see the result because there is COVID nineteen. Yeah, <laughs> okay. we did the the steps, but uh, we don't see the result. Okay, okay, so. Yeah, barely is a good term to use. <laughs> yeah, so you you're using plates, right? You're using yes. solid agar, right? Yes. yes, solid agar. Okay, but that is just one type of media, one type of uh, nutrient. I mean, the the conditions are set by that single media. So if you were to just imagine if you were you were if you were to take that plate and you were trying to isolate bacteria from the lake, UM lake, from the soil, how many do you think will grow? Do you think all the bacteria have the same requirements? No. Definitely not, right? You have you you I mean from basic theory you will know that there are many different types of bacteria. And all of them have different requirements. So there is no way you will get all the bacteria growing on your plate. That is why in, uh, in microbiology, we, have, we, we, we make certain that we, we differentiate between culturable and total bacteria. Okay? So we have to be able to differentiate this. Culturable bacteria are the bacteria that is on the plate that you have cultured out, whereas total bacteria will be all of it. Okay, so there's a difference there. So, is your work only based on culture or is your work on total bacteria? Okay, so you have to be able to differentiate them because when you present your work, when you discuss your work, it makes a difference okay between culture and total okay okay so the first question that comes into mind is if you were to culture something on let's just say a normal neutron agar how many percent do you think grows anyone less than one percent less than five percent ten percent twenty percent fifty percent any idea Five. No idea. Should we take yeah, a guess? Five percent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> less anything less than five percent. Okay. Ooh. So 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 your job as a bacteriologist, you know, if you're in research, your supervisor will probably tell you, I want this bacteria, help me isolate them. Okay? Or if you're working in the hospital, you need to isolate the pathogen. You need to know what is causing the disease okay so the, so you need to be able to grow them okay so uh let's just say if you're doing research okay so i task you with with a project i said do go isolate bacteria from um lake okay so go isolate your uh, bacteria from um lake the first question you come comes to your mind is what type of uh uh okay let's let's start with this so 
What temperature do you think you should incubate your plate in? Room temperature. Hmm? Room temperature. Okay. What is room temperature? About 28 degrees. Okay. Uh, room temperature is not stable. Right? Because at night it'll go colder, in the afternoons it'll be warm. Okay. So yeah, usually when people say room temperature is about 25 degrees Celsius, but it will be better if you have an incubator. Okay. Okay, let's just say let's set the temperature. What temperature do you think you should incubate your plate in? 30 one. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> it's okay. 30, 30, 31. There's very specific, there's a one there. <laughs> but most of the but most of the incubators are set at 30. <laughs> it's okay, 31. Well, let's make it 30, round finger. Okay, so that is one. So for in your mind, 30 is a good temperature for let's just say environmental samples, for lake samples. Okay. Uh but if you are looking for pathogens, what temperature do you think you'll be incubating at? If you're looking for human pathogens, what uh, temperature do you think? Uh, uh, human temperature, like around the average human body temperature. 37. Yeah, correct. Yeah. That, that is why in most uh, microbiological labs, you will see incubators at 37 degrees Celsius and at 30 degrees Celsius, depending on the kind of they are doing. So if they are isolating bacteria from the waters for environmental samples, they will probably incubate at 30 degrees Celsius. But if they are looking for pathogens, they will probably incubate at 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. So, so temperature uh, makes a, a, a difference. So you know from the from your basic microbiological knowledge there is there is a there 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 is a term called the uh, temperature limits of life okay so there's uh temperature Okay, so you will notice that this, I mean, you've seen this temp this temperature curve before. I mean, it's, it's common. You know that there's a maximum and there's a minimum. So there is a, there is a, uh, that is the temperature limit of life for that organism. But another interesting point is the optimum is always nearer to the maximum. Okay. That is why, uh, that is why with the current climate global warming, there's fear because most of the organisms at, at least in the tropics are already near optimum. What will happen if the temperature further increases? Okay, so that means we will be we will approach the maximum faster than other other countries. Okay, so that that is why there is a there's a worry about the global warming, especially for uh, tropical countries. Okay, so, so if you were, okay, so we've done the UM link. If I were to ask you to isolate thermophiles, you all know what is thermophiles? What are thermophiles? The chair that live in a uh, high temperature condition. Mm. So fouls, uh, thermophiles, thermophilic, philic means loving. So loving temperature, bacteria that loves temperature, okay, thermophiles. Let's just say I, I ask you to isolate bacteria from a hot spring. How will you do it? Uh, 
incubate in high temperature. Uh, so what temperature do you yeah. think you will be working with? That's interesting. Close to 100. Huh? Close to 100, I think, maybe? Uh, I think yes. based, on, based on the place uh, we take the sample, such as if we take a sample at a temperature of uh, near to 70 degrees, so that we incubate it at temperature of 70 degrees. Okay, but 100, that one is interesting. 100 is cannot. Why? Water oh. boils at 100. Right. Mm, so 100 yeah. is not practical. Uh, 60 is okay. 60, 70 is okay. Because you, you must remember, first thing is, does the agar still work? At, at, at let's just say 80, 90 degrees. What do you think will happen to your agar plates? That will evaporate. No. Hmm? It will melt or evaporate. It will dry up very, very fast. Within half a day, it will dry up. <laughs> okay. Because your what is the function of agar? Agar is to hold the water. Okay. Mm. The hold the water. That's why your 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 if you if you incubate your plates long enough, you'll see that your agar plates grow thinner and thinner. Because the water will evaporate. So when you work with thermophiles, that's why it's written here, you prepare thicker plates. Okay. So we usually don't set too high a temperature, maybe about 60 like that. Okay. Because so that the plate can at least last one day. Okay. Thicker plates and we will usually also wrap it up so that to, to reduce evaporation. Okay. We'll use a saran, uh, uh, Pyrex film to, to wrap it up. Okay, so, uh, we prepare thicker plates, but of course, uh, using broth is easier, right? Broth will be easier to handle. You all know what is broth, right? No. No, okay. So, uh, the one that you use is neutron agar, right? In your, in your practical biology. Is it neutron agar? Is it yeah. called neutron agar? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, neutron agar is a very common uh, uh, bacteriological medium. It's an artificial medium we use to culture uh, bacteria. Neutron agar is the mixture between neutron broth and agar. Okay. So if you so most of your media we buy commercially, they come either in the form of broth or agar. Okay. So if it's agar, when you prepare it, it is solid solid by itself. Okay. But if you Buy it as broth, you can prepare it as, as liquid medium. But if you want it to solidify, you add yourself agar. Okay? So agar you can add at 1.5% or 2%. Any questions? Do you understand this part? Yes, doctor. I can only hear from one person. <laughs> <laughs> That's yep. not very confident. Yes, building. <laughs> okay, so, so the agar is called, usually you buy bacteriological agar. The term is there. We add 1.5 to 5%. So if I said add 1.5 to 5%, if I ask you to make a uh, broth um, uh, that is 100 mil. How much How much agar would you add? How many grams of agar would you add for 100 mil of uh, neutron broth? 1.5 to 5. 1.5 uh, to 2 grams of... Uh, so it's 1.5 to 2 grams per 100 mil of broth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing is, if you add 1.5 grams it will be softer if you add two grams it will be hard harder okay 
So that's that's the dif difference. Usually for tropical countries, we add two grams of uh, two grams of agar per per hundred mil of broth, because uh, uh, in we want to hold more water in in tropical countries. Okay, so so now you know the difference between broth and agar, solid and and liquid media. Yes, you understand yes. now? Okay, so so and so naturally, when you're working with thermal files, incubating in broth type of media is better, right? Because uh, you don't have to worry about about it drying up so fast, right? You can just uh, screw cap it uh, in a bottle, and then you can just incubate it like that. But sometimes you still need solid agar because you need to see them growing. You need to further isolate them out for purification and all that. Because when the bacteria is growing on the plate, they grow as colony forming units. You can see uh, single dots growing uh, on the media plate. So you can pick them up easily and purify them and further work with them. Okay, But broth, they are all growing together in the, in the mixture. So it's harder to work with them. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Uh, no questions. So, uh, so one more question that I always like to ask my students is: So, if you you're working, you want to isolate from hot spring, okay? But your laboratory con laboratory equipments are all in the lab. Let's just say the the hot spring is located about two to three hours drive from from your lab. So what do you do? Freeze them. <laughs> I don't know. Freeze them? Uh, the more files? <laughs> bring a container that keeps heat. Which one? Which container keeps heat? I'm not sure. What do you what do you use at home? Thermos. Yes. Oh, okay. Ding ding ding. <laughs> so you have to sacrifice the thermos for science. So bring a thermos, go and sample the water, bring back. That's it. You work. You can work from, from. Uh, you can work in your lab. Okay. So be be ready to. To think, uh, no, to think out of the box, be ready to make use of things that are available, in order to sample and work with bacteria. Okay. Okay. So, any other questions? Uh, so temperature is is um is is of course, uh, a primary factor that will affect how you isolate and grow your bacteria we've talked about thermophiles what about cyclophiles cyclophiles are bacteria that loves cold do you think there are cyclophiles in malaysia uh no. maybe maybe in the sea not in malaysia then why do your why do the vegetables that you keep in the fridge go rot I mean, if you keep it too long, uh. <laughs> why do well, they because, rot? Because there are bacteria that live on, on the cold temperature. Yeah. So, are there cyclophiles in Malaysia? <laughs> yes, in our fridge. There are. Because when you talk about cyclophiles, thermophiles, we, 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 we forgot we forget that there is a term like obligate or tolerant. Okay, we have obligate thermophile. We have thermotolerant. Uh, right. What is obligate? Obligate means must, which means they must be. They must. They need. They require high temperatures. So we also have obligate cyclophiles. So. Uh, Cold loving bacteria that must be cultured and must grow in the cold. But we also have uh, tolerant, cyclotolerance. Okay? 
which means bacteria that, that can grow at room temperature, but they can also tolerate cold temperature and can also grow at cold temperatures. Okay, so these are terms that you need to, to know. Okay, these are terms that we use in uh, bacteriology to separate the different kinds of bacteria. So we have, so let's just say, how do you, then how do you isolate bacteria, psychrophiles? What, what, what incubator do you use? What temperature do you use? Uh, what? <laughs> Free? Psychophiles. Anyone? Psychrophiles? Uh, the temperature that the bacteria can are able to thrive best at. Yeah. So, but you want psychrophiles. So you want cold living temperature. Okay. So the best, I mean, for a microbiological lab in Malaysia, it doesn't make sense if you're gonna make if you're gonna set an incubator at uh, at the let's just say uh, four degrees Celsius because. An incubator set at a low temperature requires a compressor and is much more expensive. So what do what people usually use is just they'll, they'll just use yeah, just use yeah. Oh. That's it. Easily. We have an incubator readily available, a fridge. But of course, once you start using the fridge for bacterial work, don't put food inside. It's not safe. Okay, so you 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 have all these things available that you can use in your lab to grow uh, bacteria. Okay, you can grow cold loving bacteria. You can grow thermophiles. Okay, so temperature temperature affects uh, the type of bacteria that will grow on your plate. Okay, so. Now you know the different types of approaches that you can take to grow um, either thermophiles, psychrophiles, or mesophiles. Okay, so if I ask you, can you isolate psychrophiles from UM Lake? Can you isolate thermophiles from UM Lake? What do you think will be the answer? Is it yes or no? Will you be able to isolate? Thermophiles and psychrophiles from UM Lake. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I should think yes, maybe. Anyone, anyone else? It's a yes. <laughs> okay, so one, one, one thing that you have to remember is bacteria is everywhere everything is everywhere it is the environment that selects so there can be psychrophiles there can be tomophiles in the sample it is how you incubate them that will determine whether they grow or not okay so so if you were to take a sample from UM Lake and you incubate at 4 degrees Celsius, I'm sure there will be some bacteria that will grow. Okay. Whereas if you grow them even in, at 60 degrees Celsius, there will also be bacteria that will grow. Because there are a lot of back, a lot of different types of bacteria in the environment. Okay. So you can have different types of bacteria growing in the environment. And whether it grows on your plate depends on your uh, incubation conditions. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I just have one question. Yes. If, uh, so, like, are the psychrophiles and the thermophiles in the lake, do they lay dormant or do they, like, are alive? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, if... If they if if it is not optimum for them, they can lay dormant. But if they can, if it is, if they can, basically, 
the physiological adaptation of the bacteria, are they able to tolerate this temperature extreme for them or are they not? If they are not able to tolerate, they will lay dormant. If they are able to tolerate, they will grow. They will try to grow. Okay? Yeah. Gotcha. But because you, you remember the temperature curve that I showed you, it is not a single point. It is a curve. So there's a range where the bacteria can grow. Okay? Mm -hmm. mm, so so that's 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 one the temperature is of course when you when you talk about psychophiles, how like if you're talking about thermophiles or mesophiles, within one day you can see colony growing. What about psychophiles? How long do you think you should be incubating them? Do you do you think they will grow within one day? I guess not. <laughs> yeah. So it'll take time. So you just put it, you, you just have to uh, incubate them longer. So sometimes when you're working with psychrophiles, incubating them for one week or two weeks is quite uh, common. Okay. Because you don't have the, the, you don't have the problem of dehydration. You don't have the problem of your plates drying up when you're incubating at four degrees Celsius. So your plates can last longer. Okay, so it is okay. The only problem is maybe if you incubate too long, you get contamination starting to fungus or other contaminants starting grow to grow. Okay, but if there are no contamination, if you've done your work properly, you can easily incubate up to two weeks uh, at four degrees Celsius to see whether the bacteria grows. Okay, so temperatures is a factor. Uh, time is also a factor. Okay, how long you incubate? Wait, doctor. Why does it take longer for for cyclophiles? Ah, yeah, because because most of even though because most of the enzymes work uh better, you know, uh, there's a Q10 factor where where organisms are known to. The, the enzymatic rates are known to uh, be faster at higher temperature. So it is quite common for psychrophiles to have a slower growth rate. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Because okay. they prefer lower temperature, but their enzymes uh, works at a higher temperature? No, no. Uh, uh, the... The, the ones that tolerate will probably go lower. Oh, but the I ones that actually are cyclophiles, the ones that are obligate cyclophiles are probably in Antarctic. Okay, right. So the ones there are probably, they are optimized to grow at that environment. So they will probably have a higher growth rate than other organisms. I see. But Good. the ones that we isolate from our fridge, they are actually, they are just tolerating it. So they will have a lower growth temperature. So you have to incubate them longer in order for them to grow. All right. Okay. Okay. So, so any other questions? So next is. Okay. So we have also pH. Okay. pH. Usually we don't worry too much about uh, pH conditions because uh, most of the pH in your media is set by the manufacturer. Okay. However, one thing that I would like to point out to you is sometimes when the pH is too low, if you prepare your media wrongly and the pH is too low, you'll find that your agar don't solidify. Okay. Uh, acidic conditions in your media is usually used when we are trying to culture fun fungi. Okay. Uh, 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 fun fungal work. Okay. So when you're working with fungus, uh, your most of your media that you use will have an acidic pH. Okay. Okay. So atmospheric gas. This is also another 
important factor when you are trying to isolate bacteria. Okay, because you know that there are uh, obligate aerobes, obligate anaerobes, facultative anaerobes. You also have uh, microaerophiles. Microaerophiles are the bacteria that requires a little bit of oxygen. Then you also have, uh, yeah, so these different kinds of categories for bacteria based on the atmospheric condition that they, they require. Okay, so when you were doing your microbiology work in year one, you were only working with uh, uh, normal aerobic conditions. Okay, but we also some we also work with anaerobes, but anaerobes are harder to work with because uh, oxygen to them is toxic, so they will die if exposed to air. Okay, so usually when we work with anaerobes, we work either in an anaerobic chamber or an anaerobic jar. If it's an anaerobic chamber, it comes with uh, piped in gas, uh, nitrogen and CO2 gas. Okay, so you have to flush the chamber out so that there's no oxygen inside before you can start your work. For anaerobic jar, you'll be given uh, capsules or ampules that will reduce the oxygen in the jar. Okay. So, this capnit or increased CO2 is special. Sometimes we call it a candlelight jar method. Okay. That increases CO2 levels and concurrently reduces oxygen level. So this capnit and capnit conditions are suitable for certain types of gram-negative bacteria such as Neisseria and also Campylobacter. Okay, so, so if you look at this. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, so this is how the the usually how we work with uh, in the lab whenever we want to create a, a candlelight jar. So what we use is usually a, just a tin. Um, a Milo tin or any tin. So we put in the plates and we put in the candle. We light up the candle, we put it in, then we cover up the, the we tighten, close the, mud, mud, uh, the tin. Okay, so what happens when we close the tin? The ox, the the candlelight will continue to use up the oxygen while concurrently releasing CO2. That's why we can we can achieve a CO2 level of up to 6% and an oxygen level reduced to less than 15%. Okay, so this is the capnet environment for uh, Neisseria and Campylobacter. Okay. This is also suitable for microaerophiles, uh, microaerophilic bacteria uh, such as Streptococcus. Okay, do you have any questions? Anyone? Um, no questions. Okay. Okay, so. So I've already mentioned Aga. The function of Aga is to uh, hold the water 
in your solid media. So prepared either as 1.5 or 2%. So either other than that, light is also important, especially when you are uh, incubating, uh, trying to grow autotrophs or phototrophs. Okay, so these are uh, bacteria that requires light. So probably the most uh, famous gram-negative bacteria that that you can grow as an autotroph or phototroph are your uh, cyanobacteria. Okay, cyanobacteria is uh, considered as gram-negative. You've heard of cyanobacteria? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so cyanobacteria was previously known as blue-green algae. Okay. So for pressure, when usually only when you're working with uh, deep water microbiology, so at anything above one thousand meter deep into the sea, this gives about uh, this gives about one hundred atmosphere pressure. Okay, so the conditions there are very different because the water don't boil when the pressure is very high. Okay, so deep water microbiology, uh, deep sea microbiology, usually a lot of work now revolves around the, the, the deep sea thermal vents. Okay, deep sea thermal vents. These are these are an these are a unique unique ecosystem that is detached from solar energy. Okay, everything is based on the the warm water seeps from the earth. Okay, so this is a unique ecosystem that is not dependent on sun okay. so that's why we have uh, microbiologists uh, that works with this uh, environment because they hope to get uh, unique and novel bacteria and enzymes that they can use in the industry any questions No. Okay. So, have you all seen videos of uh, deep what uh, sea submersibles going into the going into the waters? For example, going to Mariana Trench. Yeah, I've got recommended videos of that sometimes. Oh, okay. So those are the uh, the strong researchers, the, uh, countries that are doing deep sea microbiology are uh, uh, America, uh, Japan, and China. So they have submersibles that can go go deep into the sea. Okay. Then currently, the ones holding the world record is uh, China. Okay, but this kind of work requires a lot of investment, a lot of money to build all this. Not only the submersibles, but also the the technology and the ship that can handle, that can provide logistic support. So it's not not so not feasible for a small country. Okay, so nutrients are of course important. Uh, because when you give lots of nutrients, you get a certain kind of bacteria. When you reduce the amount of nutrients, you get another kind of bacteria. So the term that we use are oligotrophs, mesotrophs, and copiotrophs. So copiotrophs are fastidious bacteria requiring a lot of nutrients. Oligotrophs require minimal nutrients minimum nutrients mesotrophs a uh, normal amount of nutrients so we can also have chemically defined media 
So chemically defined media means the formulation for the media is very specific. You know, you know all the chemicals within that media. There are no generic terms like peptone, yeast extract, because peptone and yeast extract are very general. You don't really know what, what's inside. Okay, you know it's it's a form of protein for peptone, it's a form of protein, but you don't know the specific breakdown of it. Okay, that's why for chemically defined media, you can't have terms like this. Okay. This kind of formulation are usually for general media, such as neutron agar, brain heart infusion agar. Okay, you know that they they provide adequate nutrients, but you don't really know the exact uh, chemistry of that media okay so why do you need chemically defined media uh, sometimes when you're working with mutants uh, uh, bacterial mutants you need to be able to control the formulation properly so that you can determine their biochemical pathways, okay? So that's why you have chemically defined media, also general media. For, but for most of your work, you will probably be using uh, general media. Chemically defined media is very specific, usually for those working with mut uh, mutants. Okay, any, any questions? No. Okay, no questions. Good. So, general purpose media, you have nutrient agar, blood agar, chocolate agar. So, blood agar, you require 5% blood. So, chocolate agar, what do you think chocolate agar has? Anyone? Uh, cocoa powder or chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> So blood agar has 5% blood, chocolate agar has 5% chocolate. Is that it? Mm. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, no uh, it's not. We don't, yeah, it's just a joke. It's, we don't put chocolate inside. <laughs> oh, so it's uh, not like real. It's not real. <laughs> I'm joking. Please don't put chocolate in your agar. <laughs> So, blood agar and chocolate agar, you put in 5% blood. But, uh, blood agar, uh, you put in, for blood agar, you, put, you mix the blood in below 60 degrees Celsius, so that the blood don't cook. So, your agar will be, your blood agar will be red, reddish. However, for chocolate agar, you put in the blood when the meat, when the when the when the agar is still very hot. Okay, above sixty degree degree Celsius. So once you put the blood in, it'll cook. Your blood will turn chocolate brown. So you get a nice uh, brownish agar, like chocolate. Okay, that's why they call it chocolate agar, but the, there's no chocolate inside. It's just a five percent cooked blood and five percent uh, blood. Okay, can you do you know? Can you remember the difference now? Yes. 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 Okay. So it's yes. Uh, yeah. It's 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 just a joke that I make every year. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a, I'm sorry, but uh, I've. Uh, I, I I think I misheard it, but uh, both of this agar, um, before uh, the chocolate agar, before we heat, we put the specimen first, or we heat the agar first, uh, later on we put the specimen first. Okay, okay, oh, okay. So you are preparing your agar, right? Yeah. So you know agar is solid media. So we have to, of course, autoclave the, the, the media first, right? Because okay. autoclaving will, will sterilize it, right? Right, yes. Okay. So once it's autoclaved, we can bring it out, okay? 
for normal case, we have to cool it down first before we pour. Because uh, you cannot handle if it's too hot. Uh, if it's too cold, it'll harden. So we we'll usually put it in a water bath around about uh, 50 degrees Celsius like that before we pour. We pour into the plate and then it'll solidify and then that's it. So when we want to make blood agar, after autoclaving, we bring it out. Uh, for the chocolate agar, when, in the, when the media is still hot, we can pour in the blood. Okay, so it'll, it'll cook and then we can prepare the plates. For the blood agar, we will we will cool the we will cool the base first, broth base, the agar base first, to around about uh six fifty to sixty degrees Celsius before we add the blood in. Yes, I understand. Okay. Any questions? Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, so uh, so and so we we do this after autoclaving. Will there be any contamination? No, no contamination. Okay. But you're yeah. adding blood inside. Yeah, the blood. Why is there no contamination? Oh, okay. There is no contamination if you have collected the blood properly because blood is supposed to be sterile, right? Because if 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 the blood is 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 uh, collected properly is it is it is sterile right yeah I, yeah. yeah so that's why uh there, there will be no problem but sometimes uh when you're collecting blood you have contamination from the skin so you you will get problems okay, okay. but uh ther theoretically if you've done it properly blood is supposed to be sterile so you have uh, neutron agar, you have blood, chocolate agar. So blood, neutron agar is usually for mesophilic bacteria. So blood agar and chocolate agar, what do you think they are for? Are they for oligotrophs, mesotrophs or copiotrophs? So oligotrophs are those that love, uh, that can that grow well in low nutrient, low nutrient agar. Mesotrophs are those that grow in a normal amount of nutrients. Copiotrophs require a lot of nutrients. So for blood agar and chocolate agar, do you think they are suitable for oligotrophs, mesotrophs, or copiotrophs? Copiotrophs. Yes. yes. Because, I mean, you think about, you're adding blood, Definitely, it is a very rich agar. Okay, so that's why it is very uh, nutritious. So you have other media uh, for biochemical. Okay, you also have your st standard plate count agar. Okay, this is for usually in the food industry. This is a standard plate count agar where they use in the food industry to enumerate the number of bacteria in in uh, the food samples okay because that means if the sam if if the number of bacteria growing is very high that means the level of contamination is very high and you cannot you cannot release the food out like that okay so this is a media that i want you all to know this is a resinous 2a r2a and r3a agar okay this is a very nice media that we use to isolate oligotrophs okay so resinous uh, 2a resinous 3a agar so if you look if you're if you're working with uh, uh, bacteria from the surface if you're working with bacteria from the air or places that you think have very low nutrients use this media okay this media will be good for you for your research so R2A is for isolation, R3A is for uh, maintenance. So usually the first stage of isolation, you use R2A. Then after that, when you have your bacteria growing in R2A, you want to maintain it, then you use the R3A agar. Okay.
Then you also have muller hinton agar. That's the normal standard agar that we use for anti-microbial um, susceptibility testing. Okay. Any other questions about this? Mm, is there like a specific source of blood for the blood agar? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so you have several options. You can buy a commercially available defibrinated uh, rabbit blood or ox blood or sheep's blood. Okay, you can buy defibrinated. So, but that is very, very expensive because you're buying uh, from commercial companies. So what we do is uh, we will bring the bottles, uh, sterile bottles, go to the abattoir to the slaughterhouse where they where, where where they where they will do the uh where they will process the the cow the cows for beef processing and all that okay abattoir you all know right yep <laughs> okay so there's one in Shah Alam uh, that is uh yeah there's one in Shah Alam so Usually the lab assistant will go there, then uh, ask the pachi there, the uncle there to help collect the blood. So when they slaughter the cow, they will collect the blood for you. So uh, <coughs> unless you are very brave, you can do and collect yourself, but I don't think they'll allow you in. So, but before, but when you're, you have to give uh, proper instructions. You must tell them that you do not collect the first, first, uh, first spill, the the initial, initial blood. You do not collect that because that will probably be contaminated by the skin bacteria. Okay, so you have to uh, tell them to collect it maybe about uh one minute later. Okay, so you know that blood has clotting agents. Okay, blood has clotting agents. So uh, you need, if the blood clots, you cannot use it for media preparation. It's pointless. So you need to prevent it from clotting. How do you prevent uh, blood collected from clotting? You can add EDTA, you can add uh, heparin, but once you add chemicals like this, will this affect your isolation? That is a question that you have to think about. So if it affects your isolation, then you have to think of another way. So what we usually do is we will put we will put uh, glass beads into the bottle and autoclave it together. So the glass beads will be in the bottle when when you are collecting the blood. So when you collect the blood, you will immediately have to swirl, swirl it nonstop for maybe about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, you swirl it so that the glass beads will collect all the fibrin, fibrinogens, all the, so it will prevent the blood from clotting because it, the, the glass beads will prevent it. Okay, so that's what we will do. We will collect the blood uh, and then put it in the fridge. But this blood that is collected probably will not last more than two weeks. Okay, so... Uh, because somehow there will be contamination. So, yeah. So, any questions? All right. Uh, uh, just one more. Uh, I guess I assume that uh, any type of blood will have the same effect, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And also, you must remember that nowadays a lot of uh, cows are... Uh, they are also given antibiotics. So if your research is critical, it's related, and you know, when you're preparing blood agar and you find that you're not getting the results you're expecting, you must also consider that your blood may have antibiotics or chemicals inside that are affecting your results. So be, be careful, okay? Because a lot of things can affect research.
Okay, do you have any other questions? Anyone else? No, no questions? No. Okay, so, so these are some of the media formulation. Okay, for R2A, NA, uh, brain heart infusion agar. So just just by looking at this, you can easily see, you see, uh, brain heart infusion agar, you have brain heart infusion, 8 grams, peptide digest, 5 grams, uh, pancreatic digest, 16 grams. So this is very rich, a lot of uh, carbon source in the media. Whereas when you look at R2A, it only have 0 0.5 gram of peptone, 0 0.5 gram of uh, casein, okay? So the the level of uh, the difference between the carbon source here and the carbon source here is significant and very clear. Okay, so this is for oligotrophic, and this is for a uh, copiotroph bac copiotrophic bacteria. Okay, so for neutrinaga it is mesotrophic, so it's about eight total eight grams of uh, carbon source here. Okay. So you can see the difference in the in the amount of carbon available. Then you can also see that that R2A has other things, sodium pyruvate that is that is known to resuscitate bacteria and maintain bacteria better. Okay, you can read about this. Okay, so these are different types of. Uh, okay, so what we have, what we you have here are uh, your general media, general purpose media, okay? So here are different, these are all selective media, okay? Selective media. Selective media are, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, as the name implies, it selects the bacteria that you want. So you have selective media, you have differential media. Selective media is, if if you use selective media are those that allows only a certain type of bacteria to grow differential media means when the bacteria is growing you are able to differentiate them okay so that is that is how they they name it okay differential media allows you to differentiate the type of bacteria growing on your plate. So most of the plates are actually both selective and differential, which means they select for a certain type of bacteria and also allows you to see how different they are. Okay, so this is uh, this uh, oxycholate agar, uh, eosine methylene blue agar, uh, hectone enteric agar. So these are all used for your enteric bacteria, usually for uh, E. coli, for Escherichia coli, Salmonella, and Shigella. Okay, so these are, you will see that the media, they have certain patterns. You have uh, thiosulfate here. Thiosulfate will allow the formation of black of thiosulfate with ferric ammonium citrate this combination here will allow the bacteria that can uh, form h2s hydrogen sulfide to be black colonies okay so the colonies will have black precipitates okay so when for this kind of information i will I will okay. What I'll do is I will can you see this? Can you see this? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Okay. So I will share this with you. Okay, so this is an old version, second second edition. This is the only version online, available online. This is 2009. But the good thing about all these things is the media formulation, they don't change. So let's just see.
You must also know that. Okay. You must also know that uh, some media shouldn't be autoclaved. Okay. Some media are autoclavable. Some media are not autoclavable. Okay. So when you get uh when you're asked to prepare something that you're not familiar with a new type of media please look at the bottle carefully spend a few minutes of your time and read through the instruction don't assume everything is the same okay some media also have uh, chemicals that are carcinogenic and can cause lung problems because a lot of them have a lot of chemicals inside so please be uh use caution precaution okay uh, uh yeah it's also always better to be safe so what i like about all these catalogs is they have they describe the media for you they tell you how it works the principles of procedure how it works okay so you can see that the ferric ammonium citrate and sodium thiosulfate in the medium enable the detection of hydrogen sulfide production Okay, so when you see black colonies forming like this, you know that the media, uh, that the that the bacteria is forming H2S. That's why it is black. So the good thing about all this catalog is they'll also tell you what are the suitable positive control and negative control that should uh, be uh, be used. Okay, so if you uh, you can test it out. To see whether your media is working because your if you if you culture enterococcus faecalis it shouldn't grow okay if you do uh if you culture salmonella typhi murium it should grow well so you, these are good information okay and you can see that the formulation is here they'll tell you how to prepare it you see for this one hecton and enteric agar you do not autoclave okay so uh, I will I will share this with you all. So please, uh, when you are going through your 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 course, your microbiology course, uh, whenever you come across new media, spend some time looking at the formulation, understand the uh, media. Okay. It will help in the long run, especially if you're planning to work as a, a microbiologist. Okay. Okay. So you have also selective differential agar. Okay. So you have McConkie, Yosin Methylene Blue, Hectone, a lot of different uh, types of media. Thiosulfate citrate bow salts agar, very useful for Vibrio. These are useful for Salmonella Shigella. These are for E. coli, okay, for, for coliforms. This one, Centrimid Pseudocell Aga is for Pseudomonas. Thayer Martin Selective Aga is for Nazaria. Uh, cysteine Lactose Electrolyte Deficient Aga is uh, CLAT Aga is usually for, it's, it's mainly for urine. Uh, urine samples to detect for urinary tract infection.